Are we good? Can everyone hear me? Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you very good much morning. for joining us today for our coffee and conversation with disability services. Unfortunately, right now it is ran out of coffee and conversation, but we're working on getting that remedied right away. My name is Kelly Smith. I'm the director of the CFE, and it is my pleasure to introduce our moderator for today's discussion, Mr. Ralph McFarlane. He's going to do a preliminary introduction of our panelists, and then they will briefly introduce themselves. Mr. McFarland, Ralph, is currently the Associate Director of Disability Services and has worked at TAM UCC for 13 years. He's also worked nearly 27 years in the disability services field. Prior to working at TAM UCC, Ralph was in the California State University System as the Director of Disability Services at Humboldt State University and the Coordinator of Disability Services at California State University, Northridge. Ralph's, son's, Ralph's son, James, is a proud fall 2019 freshman Islander. Thank you all so much for being here this morning. Ralph, I'll go ahead and turn it over to you. Good morning. So I do see familiar faces and some new ones that I've engaged with via the Internet already. And so I feel right at home with you. Um, what we're going to focus on this morning is letting students kind of give you a sense of what is it like to be a student with a disability both in the classroom and out of the classroom. And when I first met, I'm going to let each of them introduce themselves, but Alonzo, when I first met you 13 years ago, it was pouring rain like it was this morning. And we were trying to get Alonzo navigating across the campus. Do you remember that? Oh, that was a long time ago. Yes, it was. <laughs> okay, so without further ado, if each of you will take a turn, including you, Jen, uh, with your name, what you're studying, what year you are, and whatever you'd like to share about the nature of your disability. Okay, my name is Alonso Cuellar. Um, I'm a master's student. I study counseling, uh, focuses on clinical mental health counseling. Um, the nature of my disability, I've been blind since birth. Uh, so I have cataracts, um, my retina is detached, and I have also was born premature, so that's also part of my blindness. Uh, I'm Jennifer Weir. I, I work with Ralph in uh, Disability Services. I do the assistive technology on campus. I have a little lab around the corner from Disability Services, 119 Corpus Christi Hall. And um, I've been working in this field since 1991, uh, right when the Americans with Disabilities Act was passed. I used to work with early intervention, infants and toddlers with disabilities. I worked um, for nine years on a rehab engineering research center on aging for adults who are aging into disabilities and adults who are aging with disabilities. Um, and then I worked with uh, school districts, five counties in New York State, um, uh, doing assistive technology assessments. And then working here, I finally kind of completed it. I finally have the population of um, college students and higher education. And I also teach in the special education um, department. You got it. You got one. Hi, I'm. S Hello. Hi, I'm Stephen. Um, thanks for having me. I've been part of a panel before. I am a special education major. I am, as of the last few years, I've been considered uh, legally blind, and I have retinitis pigmentosa, which is a degenerative retina disease. So it, it's been kind of an interesting thing. Um, I was a student here back in uh, 2009, 2010, and during my first semester here, that's when I got diagnosed with my retinal disease. And so that was interesting because I didn't really know how to handle it. I didn't know about all the resources that were available. So I, I stopped going to school for a long time. And um, so over time, I've kind of learned to deal with it and learned about all the different resources that are available. And I just came back this last fall. And so far, it's, everything's been pretty good. I've been able to make like all A's since then. And I'm a senior now. So I should be graduating next fall if everything goes good. Hey, um, is this? I'm Edie. Um, I just graduated with a degree in sociology here and uh, just started the counseling program. Um, and the nature of my disability is uh, I have like distractibility, um, hyperness, um, mood swings, anxiety, stuff like that, um, sensory sensitivity, um, those types of things. So uh, am I missing anything? <laughs> Not sure. It says I have anxiety and then ask. Yeah. That sounds good. It sounds good. All right, cool. Okay. So 
Um, thank you each for sharing. And perhaps one or more of you have had one of these students in your class or students that present with similar disabilities. Um, to kind of give you a little summary of our office, we're in Corpus Christi Hall 116, just down the hall from Dr. Smith. Um, and we have other staff members that aren't in front of you this morning, but we have an exam services coordinator. Uh, that position is actually open right now. Rachel Cox, our director, is kind of filling in there right as we speak. Um, we have two other gals in the office that meet with students, as do I, in setting up the accommodations, um, sending you the letters that you've all probably seen, uh, indicating what accommodations have been approved. And then we have Jen as our assistive tech specialist and then an office administrative assistant and some student employees. So we have students that have visual impairments, obvious physical disabilities, but uh, the majority of our students, we, as of yesterday, have 285 students that have gone through the process and registered with us. That includes returning students from last semester or last year, but brand new students this year as freshmen or transfers. So out of that 285, the majority of the students are students that will be in your classroom that you will not see an obvious disability. It will be those students. There's 89 students registered with ADHD. We have 76 with mental health disorders that range from depression, anxiety, PTSD, um, schizophrenia, with various complications of the disability, but on top of that with medications that may change. Uh, we have students with uh, traumatic brain injuries, not just our <coughs> veterans, but other students that come in. Uh, we have students that are hearing impaired, that you may be asked to recruit a volunteer note taker in class, or for a student with attention deficit, uh, or a student that has an assistive lift listening device, or students that um, may need to take a periodic break from class because of stress or anxiety. So. 285 students, by the end of this semester, there'll be over 300. Uh, over 1,000 requests for accommodated exams have already been made, meaning out of the 285, there's probably 260 that have clicked their classes on our system and said, I want Dr. Smith or Dr. Lon or Etheridge to, to receive a letter that's not going to tell you what the disability is, but it's simply going to say, Ralph is eligible for time and a half on exams, reduced distraction. Those, as you know, are kind of the cookie cutter ones. The more challenging ones are for a student that may have a chronic uh, health issue that will have periodic attendance issues. And so you may see kind of a, a rather concerning statement on a letter that says flexible attendance based on disability related absences. And we're not going to mandate to you what's reasonable. We're going to leave that up to you as to discussing that with the student to determine what's reasonable that doesn't fundamentally alter the nature of your course, meaning if you've got guest speakers or you've got group work, things that can't be duplicated in that experience, that's going to be more challenging. So don't fret when you see that statement. Please call us and let's engage in that conversation. Okay. Any questions so far? We're going to be pretty informal in here. So the process, again, very briefly, is a new student um, will go to our website. We used to do this by hand, typing your letters times 300 times four classes each. It was a nightmare. So what happens now is the student fills out a brief application. They get an email that says, please <coughs> upload your documentation, which doesn't necessarily have to be on one of our forms, but just to kind of show you that what we hope to get from a student, where is that not opening up, Jen? Oh, here we go. That typically we want something in writing from a licensed healthcare professional um, that would include the diagnosis of the disability, the functional limitations. So the student signs a release, we get a diagnosis, the level of severity, how it's impacting the student, typically in the academic setting. So be assured that when you have a student that sent you a letter or is taking a test in our office, we're not simply inviting the whole world without documentation to receive accommodations. We expect something in the, in the measure of this, but we also dialogue with the student in an interview. Um, direct observation is a no-brainer, too. So if you had a student that broke his or her arm, skateboarders, happens all the time, 
pardon the pun, during spring break. They're coming in. So we can serve that student. If there's an obvious cast, I'm not going to wait for the student to bring me something from the doctor. So we can go that route too. But our team reviews new applicants every Wednesday morning. So we have some students that you will get a letter mid-semester and you're going, you're scratching your head going, well, why did I just get this letter now? Well, it may be that students choose not to use accommodations. Maybe after the first midterm, they have a come to Jesus moment and say, yeah, I, I need that extended time. So and then we have students that procrastinate and leave it to the last minute. But there's also maybe some issues about stereotypes. I mean, we are called disability services. I'm not thrilled with that name, but it is what it is. So we have new student freshmen that come in. They don't want to be associated with our office. I'll get a call from a parent who says, Ralph, did Mike come in there? And I go, Mike who? Oh, we met you during orientation. So it's usually when the student is either in crisis, distress, or academic jeopardy that they come in. OK. So let's start this off. Maybe Edie will start with you. Um, so when we met with Dr. Smith, it was kind of, what's, uh, what's the day in the life of a student with attention issues? Um, either in the classroom, out of the classroom, the whole gamut? Uh, yeah, so day in the life. So um, that's interesting. So I guess I'll start off with um, sometimes I have, like, my moods go up and down, so I have flights of ideas. So uh, I'll get a project, and I'll have seven ways to take it. And then um, my mood will dip, and I'll just end up turning in something that I don't even really know what I did. Um, and also with that is sometimes I will share a lot in class, and then the teacher will call on me thinking that I know the answer because the other day I knew, like, all of them. And um, I don't even remember which parking lot my car is in. Um, seriously, due to, like, meds and stuff, I've spent an hour or more looking for my car in the parking lot for weeks when I always park in the same parking lot. So... It's really up and down and everywhere. Um, so sometimes it feels like the world is at, you know, regular speed. And you know how you can speed up a video? I feel like I'm at 1.5 speed, and um, it, there's just a lag, and it's very frustrating. <laughs> um, but, yeah, also with that, um, I, I'll find any reason not to have to sit down in class. Um, and... I'll, you know, I've been inappropriately, yeah, I've been told I was inappropriately leaving class or I'll try to sit at the back or I've actually had students like uh, videotape me for Snapchat to post on, to post on Snapchat and stuff like that. So um, the inverse of that, sometimes I come to class and uh, I, it's a victory I came to class. I don't know how I got there. Um, and I just can't sit around people. I actually came here early so I can sit on the edge. I don't like being in the middle of anything. So if I'm late um, and all the edge spots are taken, I just I just won't go to class. I'll skip it. Um, yeah, and then if a student is, like, doing this or, like, clicking their pen or something like that, I'll leave too. And um, with that, sometimes uh, professors talk too loud. And I've made – a C in several classes, not because I didn't know the material, but because this professor spoke too loud and I just couldn't. I felt suffocated by their voice, um, which I understand there's people with hearing impairments too. And sometimes I'll wear like earphones to kind of uh, curb the noise a little bit, but sometimes that's interpreted as being rude. So um, yeah, and also like I'm, how I'm kind of going on a tangent right now. I have distractibility. Um, it's hard for me to stay focused. Um, and sometimes I'll do like multiple things at once, like do a puzzle on my phone or write or like draw or something like that to focus more. And it, it does make me look rude and like I'm not paying attention. Um, but yeah, I would say that uh, I mainly, um, oh yeah, I would also like wait, you know, until other students are completely done with their test to even start mine which there would be like 15 minutes left before I started testing with disability services. So I would just start circling things pretty much. Um, or I would get really anxious and leave after a roll was called and a teacher would call me out in front of everyone and be like, hey, you can't leave after a roll was called. Like you can't just come and get attendance credit and then not stay for class and stuff like that. So um, yeah, basically I approach class like I did this panel 
which is I put it off until the very last minute and then I freak out and try to figure out what I'm going to say. So um, yeah, that's, that's what a class is like for me. Um, yeah. Thank you, Edie. For that. Kind of a, in following up with Edie's um, sharing with you, um, what I am thrilled to see is most, if not all of you in your syllabus have already had a statement that kind of sets the culture in your class and welcoming students with disabilities um, to seek services in our office. Um, and when I said we used to do it the old-fashioned way, typing the forms, what that meant was the new student or the returning had to come back to our office, pick up the forms, and had to go to your office to meet. And that was a plus. That was when the student could engage with you and talk about, you know, what Edie has shared and what some of the others will. But now, um, we have to strongly encourage the student because the letters now are electronically sent. So what I'm always pleased to see is when, and it has happened often this semester already, not just with me, but probably Jen and the others, you as faculty have already emailed us and said, Ralph, I've got a concern about this student, or this student came to my office. And so we're going to talk about, well, what can faculty do? Well, you're doing some of the things already, whether it's the syllabus statement, reaching out to us, um, setting that climate and culture in your classroom, the, the topic of universal design in your curriculum and the methods that you're teaching, and we'll talk more about that. Stephen, do you want to share with us about some day in the life of Stephen Fuentes in and out of the classroom? Uh, sure. Um, so for me, a typical day in the classroom is, I guess I've just sort of benefited from having not so great teachers in the past. And by that, I just mean like they love lectures and not really a lot of other things. So even before my vision had declined a lot, I just became good at listening. So that's helped me now because now, uh, unfortunately, it doesn't really matter where I sit. I almost could never see anything on the smart board. Like I can make out like the pictures and like videos when they play videos, but I can't make out any of the words. So I've just had to get really good at listening. Um, I'm allowed to record lectures. And then I've just gotten pretty good at like note taking also. Uh, for the most part, like in my SPED courses, like I let everyone know. And at this point, I've had a lot of people in the same classes. So everyone knows within like the first day, like introductions about like my disability and how that does and doesn't affect me. But in other courses, I kind of just make it a point to like not mention anything. And I let people like kind of get to know me. And then if I know them a little bit better, then I'll tell them because I have. With my disability so far, I mean, I can kind of like, I don't want to say mask it, but I can go a while without anyone like noticing that there's like anything different. And that's kind of the point is uh, just kind of letting people know like if you have a disability or not, like you're still like a person. So, uh, and that's been helpful with like special education is they teach person first language. So you wouldn't say like the autistic kid or the blind kid, you would say, you know, the person with autism or the person who is blind. So. I mean, for the most part, it's it's fairly normal. I just I do things differently, so I just focus on listening a lot more. And uh, even with my note taking, it, it helps me to do it on my laptop. But sometimes I'll handwrite it because I feel like I'll remember it more. But there's a lot of times where I, I don't do a good job with like reading my own handwriting. So uh, sometimes it just sinks in more with handwriting. And then if I need to, I can just take a picture or use my camera just to zoom in and read it. But that, that's pretty much it. To follow up with Stephen, too. So when you see in your letter that a student's been approved for digital recording lectures, that might be concerning, too, depending on the nature of your course. And so um, in the uh, beginning process with the student, when they sign up for uh, our services, there's a recording lectures agreement. So be assured that they have agreed with me in writing that, one, they will not share the recordings with other students or upload them to YouTube. Two, that you as a professor, if at any time during the class, you say, if anybody's recording, please pause. That may be because a student's sharing something of a sensitive nature. Dr. McClellan called me uh, last semester, said I'm not really comfortable with this for my criminal justice because I have guest speakers coming in with very sensitive information. So in those cases, we're going to defer to you what's reasonable. Um, and three, that at the end of the semester, if they're checking a digital recorder out from Jen, that that will be returned and uh, the recordings are erased. Okay. Alonso, how 
How about the day in the life of Alonso Cuero? <laughs> Microphone. Yeah. Let me close. Day in the life of Alonso is coffee. <laughs> yes, it is. Uh, okay, so um, basically, so I'm blind. Uh, my disability to me is something I don't consider disability. I don't consider my blindness a barrier for myself. Uh, my everyday life and classroom activities, um, I've had a lot to where I'll go to class and there's a lot of visual stuff on, on visual representations on the board, projecting PowerPoints. Um, professors also do give out handouts. Um, so that's one other thing. And some, a lot of the times a student will have to read it to me, which is fine. I don't consider that a problem. Uh, some of the times the handouts will be emailed to me in advance and I thank the professors that have done that. Um, so that's always helpful to me to have it before class so I can look at it in case I need to participate in a group activity. Uh, other times, uh, the PowerPoints, uh, they're not, some of, some of the professors do not give them until after class so I have to take notes and I've gotten pretty good about doing that so I can just listen and take notes. I have a laptop with a screen reader um, so I'll use headphones in class for the screen reader to output the text into speech and that's how I do all my activities. So all my things in the computer, I read with uh, text-to-speech and I navigate the computer with text-to-speech. Um, uh, I also use Braille too. So sometimes uh, I have not done it as often but I do have a Braille display that I do carry with me sometimes with my laptop and I will read on my braille display as I'm typing or if I need to read a PowerPoint, uh, when I make a presentation, I will read a braille outline on my braille display or I'll write my own braille outline and I'll take it to the to class just to be organized. Um, let's see, uh, sometimes uh, I'll go to class and Sometimes, you know, it, it's uh, sometimes difficult since if we got like a, since I'm in the counseling department, if we got a whole case study, it's like, oh, I got to read two pages of the <laughs> of material. So that's where it'd be helpful to have it beforehand. But in in the end, you know, there's certain ways and I'll, we'll make it work. The students are, are very respectful and they read to me and I'm thankful for that. Uh, so that's basically what I do, uh, the life of me uh, in class. Uh, I know when I first started here in 2005, I think it was 2000, yeah, 2005, um, the disabilities department uh, was growing and it's grown immensely now. Now we've got uh, wonderful people that do the technology work and uh, we've got a wonderful staff that deals in and out with the disabilities department. Now everything's electronic, so that's, it's going very good direction. Thank you. When following up with Alonso, and we're going to talk about well, what can faculty do that um, builds on what you're already doing? And, and I briefly mentioned the concept of universal design. So, to the extent that you can, and we're not expecting you to to be mind readers and know who's in your classroom that needs uh, accommodations. But as Alonso has said, for somebody that's visually impaired or blind, as you're at the whiteboard. Um, perhaps verbally describing what it is that you're writing there, and that not only benefits a student like Alonso and maybe even Edie and Stephen, but all of your learners in the class that may be auditory learners too, that you're describing what you have. Maybe you've got <coughs> students, and you do, in your classroom that are hearing impaired or deaf, and so if there's group work where they're sitting at a, a table, you know, have them sit in a round circle so that that student with a hearing impairment can if he or she reads lips or is following who's speaking, um, kind of set some ground rules. Uh, it might also be, let's not have multiple speakers at once. Uh, let's repeat a, a question that a student has raised his or her hand on. So we can elaborate more on that.
I remember that. If you don't know, he's uh, a twin brother with uh, similar fair capabilities. And I was teaching a class, and this happened a couple of times, uh, in which it's literature and film. And I really did not know how to, I mean, I taught to teaching regular students how to read film as a literature as well. So what I would do, and I never knew if it was helpful, but I would sort of sit in the back uh, with the students and sort of describe the film as it was going on. And I don't know, I still don't know what kind of accommodation I'm supposed to uh, make good students who are sort of uh, profoundly visually impaired and don't see anything at all. It may be in the class, so, so I mean, in terms of academic success, it may make a difference. But um, along for how do we help students to film? Okay, uh, so you're going about it the right way. Uh, description, there is, some, there is a lot of services called audio description, and they do describe movies and things. These were, by the way, like 70-year-old films. Those were historic yeah. films. And so I right. didn't know about that technology okay. that wasn't available for movies. So right, uh, but simply just uh, sitting down with the student and you know, ask him, is it comfortable for me to describe the, the, uh, what's going on in the film for you? Um, I've had that done to me on several occasions, and... That's helped me a lot to understand what's exactly going on and maybe the message to get across that you're trying to uh, get across for the lecture that day. Chuck, I remember that phone call from you. Just, st just stepping right in and following your instinct. That's why we, again, encourage students to meet with you during office hours, but that doesn't always happen. But I guess just being flexible and reasonable but maintaining the integrity of your course. I remember that, Chuck. All right. Any other questions or suggestions? How can faculty help? As uh, Dr. Etheridge has already given an example, we've talked about universal design. Anything else come to mind? Edie, Stephen, Alonso? Um, so one thing that um, all of my teachers have been doing recently that's a really helpful universal design thing is uh, they've gotten into the habit of just posting every PowerPoint on Blackboard so you can follow along and so for me, since I can't see the things on the smart board, I just have my laptop and then I can have that there and be able to view that easily. And then I have the features on my laptop that allow me to, to zoom in or invert the colors if the text is hard to read. So uh, also with handouts and stuff, those are available on Blackboard and then I can just pull those things up instead of kind of struggling to read the papers. So things like that are like a, a universal design type choice you can make that is really helpful for me. I think um, getting, like Steve said, getting the um, materials ahead of time is really helpful. But you think um, Alonzo said he'll he'll braille some of the stuff and bring it to class. I can also do the brailing. So if if there's an exam or something and there's a student, um, maybe there's some kind of a, a graphic on the exam or a chart. I can either braille it. I have a machine that'll puff up. Um, the um, image, so say you have a like a 3D map or you have a chart and you want the student to be able to feel it, I can puff it up so that it's tactile. Um, we also use um, wiki sticks in the office um, for tactile images. Um, we can lay, they're, they're basically like, um, um, I guess it's kind of like rubberized, uh, yeah, and you lay it over the top of it and then the, the student can feel it. I used to do that for one of our students was a psychology major that was blind when I first started here. Oh, yeah, and I, and I used to do that for him. Um, but sometimes the exam, uh, we, he would have an exam and it would be for psychology and there were always all sorts, sorts of um, charts and visual images on it but we would get it like 15 minutes before and so I'm like hurriedly trying to get get something ready for them um, because we don't want to really describe it more than we have to we don't want to describe anything incorrectly so getting materials to the students and as well as if it's something for an exam getting them to us ahead of time so that we can prepare it so that the student has um, the best possible rep representation um, on that note, knowing what your textbooks are going to be well in advance so that, like Steve and Alonzo, I get their books for them in alternative format. And if they're finding out, if the books, the bookstore kind of messed up a, a lot of my students' classes this semester, so I've been kind of scrambling. 
but um, if you know ahead of time um, and you get it, get it out there and it's the correct edition, then I'm going to have already ordered it and gotten copyrights from the publisher and get it ready in alternative format for the, for the students. Just to chime in on that, so a student still is required to purchase the textbook. And so Jen, for copyright issues, will require the student to provide a receipt or have the book in hand. As far as the exams go, too, I think our new system, most of you are already emailing when you get that notification. On your letter, you'll see that link as you have, and you click that, and you fill out the form that tells our exam services staff how much time the class has, or notes permitted, is it open book, closed book. Once you've done that for the first student in that same section, you will not be required to repeat that process with us in sending you know, that form. Unless, however, something changes in the second midterm, you're now permitting notes or a calculator is no longer permitted, then we're going to want to have that information. Also, while we're on the uh, issue of exams, sometimes you'll notice that a student has scheduled an exam, if your class is 12 to 1250, and the student scheduled it for 11 or 11.30, typically that's because, of course, they have a back-to-back -back classes. So don't be fearful of asking the student during office hours or an email and say, hey, I see that you have scheduled this test, and uh, if you need to see their schedule, they should be able to provide you that. Be assured, too, at our end in our system, our exam services staff uh, are trying to keep up with when the student has scheduled the test, we can see their schedule, and if it's a 12 to 1250 test and the student scheduled it for 11, we send a notification to the student that says, you'll need to reschedule the test or you'll need to talk with Dr. Etheridge and an email and show us that on your phone or some sort of communication that it's okay by you that this student has taken the test at a time other than your class. If it's because of when I had this, Dr. Moreno, you know, called and said, Ralph, this student took the test four days later. Uh, she said that it was work-related, and I said, well, that's not an accommodation. So we're sticking to the policies and procedures that we have in place if it's a student schedule conflict. Yes? I was just wondering if the student rescheduled an exam for disability reasons, if uh, Dr. Ed's last time, disability services also offered proctors if it's a different time than usual, or if it's our responsibility as faculty to be available for double time if it's a time that's Okay, so the question is, for a student that needs to take it, maybe they've had a seizure or something and they missed the, the originally scheduled test, can they reschedule it? If you're open to a makeup exam, if the student's already registered with us, certainly we can do the same process that they would do once you and the student determines, I'm going to take it on this date and time, they schedule it with us and you'll get that notification and you'll just email that. Sometimes on your letter, you're going to see the typical alternative testing. It'll say time and a half reduced distraction. Some students don't need the time and a half, but with a chronic um, health issue that misses the test, it'll say special arrangements for exams, which will say something to the effect of if there's a makeup and you're open to it, we can proctor that exam. So yet, to do it in your office, God bless you if you're willing to do that. Might put the student on a little more nervous alert, but uh, we can help with that. Now, if it's a if it's a student that's not registered with us, and this has come up, and I know that academic testing in the past in the round building has not been able to accommodate students without disabilities, um, we typically don't do that. Um, we have students that obviously have gone through the process. Uh, there is some confidentiality involved in testing with us, but if you've got a student that on a rare occasion that discloses to you, I've got this disability, I haven't registered with them, and I told you we meet every Wednesday's mornings and you guys have a test on Thursday, I'll do everything in my power to get that student registered. Even sometimes they'll come in and just show us the prescription, but I'm going to follow up with you and I'll say, well, here's what I've got. I don't have the formal medical form, but I've got enough that more likely than not this student has ADHD or whatever. We'll try to be flexible at our end, too. Okay. Yes. Hi, Jennifer. Sometimes the research is being done on particularly like videos showing students actually 
Sure. Um, well, first of all, I know you have to be kind of careful about what types of resources you're using. If you haven't met Carol Schroeder yet, she'll be on you. <laughs> um, if it's something that you're, that you're using across the board that hasn't gone through um, the IT's vetting for um, their accessibility and for security also. Um, so just, just be aware that you might, you might be checked up on um, for that. Basically though, um, at, again, um, doing it ahead of time, uh, we can help um, figure out which ones are accessible and which aren't. Distance Ed can also, so can Carol. Probably the, the, most, um, the most that we see is that uh, sometimes there might be flash or um, you know, some kind of video that it wouldn't be accessible and, and we can help with that um, and Distance Ed can as well. Uh, secondly would be the captioning um, and, and that's something that, that we've been struggling with on a system level. Um, the uh, TAMU system is trying to get some contracts with some um, uh, captioning and trans um, companies that'll do transcripts. The captioning is actually easy to do. It's getting the transcript that's very, um, it's just really slow. It, it, it takes a long time. And so if you're looking at third party stuff like that, um, there may be some copyright issues with the third party um, captioning as well, but to get a transcript to provide to the students since you can't actually edit the video. But like I was saying, TAMU is trying to get some contracts for um, less expensive captioning services um, that we can get like a, s um, a, a system wi wide rate for it. Right now we're just referring out to different um, captioning companies um, that are, um, you know, it, it, can, it can be kind of expensive. Um, to be honest, that's, that's probably one of the, um, the most like volatile discussions in the university now is who's going to pay for the captioning because it's, it's required and um, nobody's really prepared or, or budgeted for it. So be careful. Um, go ahead. Sorry. So I had one in the um, online class recently by Odell. Mm -hmm. they, they yeah. Two separate ones. One was like content warning. Right. And, and the other one was like teaching disability and content warning. Mm -hmm. Yes, actually, I designed that with Lauren Guerra, the whole checklist, and I used to do, for a couple years, I was doing those, and, and before they hired Lauren. Um, so yes, that does. Um, if you're getting, in, but not all of the, um, the, the classes were being checked like that. So if you're having that done, that's a very thorough checklist, and that's checking copyright as well. So yeah, good, good job. <laughs> yeah. And that was for online classes, um, but you're, you know, uh, th the regular classes are still using materials that you're presenting in Blackboard as well. So um, contact Odell, they can take a look at it. I can help you, especially with the PDFs. Um, in fact, because if, especially if you have a student in your class, I'm trying to make sure that all of your materials in your curriculum are accessible for that student. And um, I have software that's better than um, what Odell has and what um, IT has. It's called Abby Fine Reader, and it's OCR software that helps make um, tagged PDFs. It's, it's very expensive software, which is why we have a couple of copies of disability services, but others don't. But I can make like a Word document out of a, a, a scanned picture, and um, it works pretty well. And it, it's, it's really quick, too. So. So I can definitely help you out with that. But um, yeah, get them ahead of time. I'm happy to look through your class. I'm happy to um, look through your, your Blackboard materials to make sure that they're accessible, um, readable by software that Alonzo uses, which is called JAWS, the screen reader. Also readable by Kurzweil 3000, which we have about 90 students using um, this semester, which is text-to-speech software for people with um, dyslexia or uh, low vision. So, yes?
more need to create the cloud space on a first floor where we don't we're not at the mercy of the department not wanting to come in. Um, maybe I'm speaking to the wrong people, but it, it is something that comes to my mind that we just we can't accommodate what we need to do. Yeah, and I remember that situation and it's still a risk. Um, and John Dawson um, it, you may have seen the email that's going out that he got funding. Um, this is not going to be a quick fix. Um, but to answer the first part of your question, we do get involved, but but we have this happen very often. Well, um, there's a problem getting into this building. Well, we're not funded to get a curve cut there or fix the elevator. So your advocacy on the behalf of the student and, and your fellow colleagues that may have physical issues getting up and down the stairs. Um, so I know Dr. Dawson is getting it in the works to get these um, functioning. It used to be literally, and by the way, we have an elevator task force team that meets regularly that, you know, one thing we never had was when the elevator's out of service, let's get a sign that says, you know, here's an alternative route if there is one. In that case, first floor, you're right, I remember the digital lab issue that that student could not access. So, you know, you, we've got to advocate more for a, a reasonable alternative. Um, so, elevator task force, yes, you can contact our office, um, we'll notify, you know, and even just being observant as you already are, even if it's an elevator that's not functioning or it's a low tree branch on the mm -hmm. sidewalk that Alonzo might bounce his head on uh, or some sort of trip hazard, which we've got tons of them, if we're all a group and team here for Dr. Quintanilla says service excellence. Well, that's service excellence, what you did with regard to that student, what you're all currently doing. Any other? Yes, sir. Uh, totally different subject. Emotional support animals. Glad you brought that up. I appreciate that. Emotional support animals. Yeah. And then students in the class who say they're totally forgot about them. Yeah. So the question is uh, ESAs, emotional support animals in your classroom versus service animals. So. And at the staff development, we did a, a session on this. So, and by the way, I've got two documents. I'll email to Dr. Smith. She can send it out to you guys. We do have a campus procedure on service animals and ESA. So emotional support animals are animals that can range from anything from a lizard to a mouse to a guinea pig, uh, which typically are not permitted in your class. Uh, that is falls under the Fair Housing Act, and so if a student says, I want to have my cat in my room, they do have to provide documentation to housing staff from a, typically a psychologist uh, indicating that without this emotional support animal, the student would not be able to benefit and access housing. They're not permitted to take that animal out of the, the dwelling. Now, if they want to have that as an accommodation in your classroom, Chuck, we're not going to flat out deny it but more likely than not, after we, we're going to engage with the student and say, what other accommodation can we implement in Dr. Etheridge's class for you? Might be those periodic breaks that Edie was talking about if you're over anxious, or conversations too would be, okay, well then, you have this ESA cat that you want to bring in Chuck's class. Um, when you go to the movie theaters, when you go to the restaurants, how do you function there without your emotional support cat? So we're going we're gonna to ask those questions. We, where we are limited in the ability to ask questions is if a student claims, this is my service animal. And under the Department of Justice and Office of Civil Rights guidelines, a service animal is limited to a dog or, in rare occasions, a miniature horse. And you may have seen the miniature horse on the airlines recently. So in that concept, if a student claims a service animal, there's two questions we can ask, you as a professor or me or even a fellow student. And number one is, is this dog required because of a disability? I cannot ask, what's the disability? I can't ask, well, after they say, well, the dog is obviously enough. First of all, if Alonzo's got a service animal, he's not using his cane, it's pretty obvious. If, when it's not obvious, that's when we can trigger that first question. Is the animal trained or needed because of disability? And then second is, what is the um, task that the dog is trained to do. Now we can't ask that they demonstrate that. So hopefully we're going to get a clear cut answer. So that, in that case, they don't have to register with our office if it's a legitimate service animal. Um, they don't have to have a vest on the animal, a card, which many of them do because they've gone online and they paid $85 for something that they don't need for 
quote, a service animal. Um, now, if the service animal in your classroom is disruptive, if it's getting up and the changer, and we had this happen with a veteran that was very distracted by the service animal, or if the dog urinates in the class or is growling, um, then it has to be under the control of the handler. And if not, you have the right to ask, could you please exit the classroom? We're not going to deny access. Um, maybe it's happened in the library. What we would say is, without your dog, if you need to come back and need assistance getting a book, or you're welcome to come back to my class with the animal, only if provided it's under your control. Yes. Following up on that, what if it's not a, an issue of control, but the allergy? OK. So you've got one student that claims a service animal in your class. The other one has an allergy. Then what we would look at, and it's not only we could do it, but is there a different section of the same course that we could switch? Two, is it how severe is the allergy? Is it you sit on that side of the class? Or we've had professors that have allergies, too, and they've got this guy with a service animal. So that's when it's challenging. We might want to look at HEPA filters or what else can we do in that case. Or is it possible, is there another accommodation without the service animals? So we'd really have to engage you as the faculty member, the student, or students, perhaps our office too, and see what's, what's reasonable here that that does occur. What's tricky then is student claims they have a dog as an emotional support animal in the residence hall. Suddenly they want to bring the dog, and now it's magically transformed into a service animal. So the students are getting hip to this kind of stuff. It's not just on this campus. It is across the country. Yes, sir. Good question. So the question is, you receive our letter. It's not going to say that Ralph has ADHD. It's just going to say time and a half, reduce distraction. Going back in the beginning, where we used to manually type the letters, and they had to bring it to you during office hours, now we strongly emphasize, I still want you to follow up with your professor during office hours. I want you to talk about things. What about a pop quiz or you know, periodic breaks? Let the, the faculty know to the extent you're comfortable why you need to get up and exit the classroom. In the initial process, when the student signs up with us, we have some information consent release forms. There's one for you as professors where students can pick or choose to submit this, and it doesn't give us permission to say, well, so-and-so has PTSD, but it's to dialogue with you. So it is the student's responsibility to engage in our process, go through the process, procedure, inform you, go to your office hours, but that doesn't always happen. So what has happened, and I mentioned earlier, is uh, I have had you as faculty reach out to us and feel comfortable doing that because I can pull up and see how much information I can share but kind of help you and me support the student within reason, but they have to engage in the process. Obviously, if you see a student struggling, even if it's it maybe even a student that's coughing and hacking, you're probably going to interact and say, did you know, you know we have a health center, your student fees cover that? Same thing, if a student is engaging in classes, answers the questions, participating, but then goes to take a test and it's not reflective of what you've heard and seen in the classroom, you can sit and reach out and say, how's it going? Do you have these struggles in high school or other classes? And while you're not going to ask, do you have a disability, you can say, well, you know, we have resources. We've got CASA. We've got the Counseling Center for Time Management Skills, Study Skills, Test Taking Strategies. We've got Disability Services if you're a student with dyslexia, et cetera. So and long story a little longer, no. But the more you can and feel comfortable doing it, God love you. Yes. So the question is, for those students with mental health issues, whether it's PTSD, depression, anxiety, typically at periodic breaks from class for the veteran, the other student that needs to step out. Um, 
And in many cases, it is an option to take tests in our testing area where it's smaller. We have cubicles. We have um, sound reduction headphones to wear. Um, they have a little extended time if they need to get up and use the restroom or step out of the testing area. So typically, that's what it is. Um, sometimes it's students that have back injuries um, that just need a, a different chair that we can help if we've got them through SSC to get the chair there. But um, medication changes can affect that student with a mental health disorder. So some uh, flexibility and reasonability if they have missed class, but do expect that they give you some information, um, whether it's documentation or, you know, a conversation that says, this is what occurred, and we encourage that too. Be proactive, email your professors if you can't attend class, um, and let the professor know that you're going to seek copies of notes or follow up with a classmate and do your part to get the information that was covered. But we're not going to give carte blanche, a, um, you know, passes to not attend your classes. Good question. Yeah. I, I just wanted to chime in on the, the gentleman's question from before. Um, one thing, like, I, I'm not shy about letting people know about my disability, but one thing that uh, I've had a couple of teachers do is they'll, they'll tell the class, like, the first day of the semester, hey, everyone, make sure to check your email, and they will have, like, already sent me an email personally. So that's just, like, an easy way to, to kind of do that without bringing attention to it. We've got about 10 minutes left. Um, any other comments, feel free to jump in. Edie, Steven, Jen. I was going to say regarding so -so? Um, the, I've talked to Carol regarding the, the visual impairment stuff, and she also has this free um, cool program where you can put the foreground and the background color to see if colorblind people can see your PDF or your PowerPoint or whatnot. Um, so yeah, I was going to, or you can just put it in grayscale as a hack, but it doesn't. It's not completely convertible, but um, yeah, I was going to add that. Um, also, as far as like visual impairments, uh, all Windows computers have a built-in feature uh, called magnifier, and so that blows it up really big. And also, once the magnifier is turned on, uh, it lets you invert the colors, and so that that can make it a lot easier to read. Also. And then uh, every, uh, I'm not sure when they implemented it, but every uh, Microsoft Edge, like in the top right corner is a function called read aloud. And so that's a, a screen reader. So that provides access for like articles and stuff like that too. Uh, it's top right on Microsoft Edge, or if you right click on the text, it'll say read aloud. And so th that's a free thing that anyone can use. I have classmates that don't have disabilities and they like using it just because they don't really want to read, so. Yeah, Windows and, and Macs, but uh, Windows 10 has really good um, uh, speech to text as well. Um, so if somebody wants to write their papers using their voice, um, and and you know we can uh, here at Disabilities Office can help help them uh, get in touch with that and tell them how to how to use it. Great to use free things. <laughs> yes, Lewis. Uh, I was just going to say, yeah, I can second that. 
Um, I, I think I said this earlier, but I've had professors think I was being rude to them when it had nothing to do with them. I was just trying to make it through the class at the best I could, and I looked like a squirming five-year-old, but um, yeah, so sometimes I think I said I'll do two things at once to help me listen and stuff like that instead of just like trying to sit there. But um, yeah, definitely. Um, the, the teachers that take it rude, I don't tell them about any of my stuff. I just get a C, so. Yeah, and with that, I've uh, actually one of my favorite classes I ever had was a biology class because uh, Dr. McCullough, I think that's how you say it, um, we had um, essays for our exams, but she would let me draw what I was talking about instead of write it, and I made an A like so easily because um, I was able to explain it. Um, not that I'm a good drawer or anything, but um, sometimes it just makes more sense in pictures, so. And that kind of touches on the universal design to the extent you can. Other options for a student to demonstrate their abilities and knowledge. Sometimes it might be, you know, group work or a speech or somebody that's on the autism spectrum that doesn't do well in front of people. Some other, you know, assessment of their knowledge, uh, whether it's drawing pictures or doing a dramatic scene or something. So a few minutes left. Any other questions, comments? I think we had a good discussion. Do you have any closing statements, Alonso? You're good. Okay. Any more coffee? Any more coffee? <laughs> Jen? Um, the digital symposium that Odell is putting on um, October 5th. Uh, if you were at the Employee Development Day, IT uh, Disability Services and um, Odell put on a we, we did a, all of the assistive technology from, um, from my lab. Uh, we, we did a display. We're repeating that for the digital symposium, so come and check it out. You can see a lot of the assistive technology that we have available on campus that your students are using. I just wanted to say um, I personally really like writing, so like I always make sure to do the writing assignments, but one thing that my teacher does that's kind of cool is uh, there's certain writing assignments where she'll let people know you can either write this one to two page paper or you can uh, create an audio file and just submit an mp3 to me so I did that once just for the fun of it but that's another alternative thing yeah and I was just gonna say, oh um, I was just gonna say like I've also um, like uh, missed tests not because I was um, you know studying extra or anything but because I you know I had one class where I went the very first day it was abnormal psych and I was like I'm not going to this again. I've been diagnosed with this. I'm not going to go learn about it in the class. And um, I made like a 98 in the class, and I, I uh, missed the test, but I went in right then. And the teacher let me, I emailed her, and she let me take the class, and I or take the test, excuse me. And I finished it in eight minutes and made it 98. So um, while I realize I'm not allowed that or anything, um, it does help to kind of be worked with sometimes to be like, oh, hey, the, I, I just had a routine and I feed the cats during this class. I don't go to this class, so um, yeah. And I think just one more thing is like, um, if a student is like notorious for something, like being distracted or um, something like that, not not playing into that with the class and like making fun of the student with the rest, the rest of the class is, because um, yeah, like I'll, I'll play along with it as well and act like, oh yeah, it's funny, it's my personality or whatever, but um, inside I'm like, that's really annoying, so. And with that, Kelly, I'm going to turn it back over to you.
Thank you, everybody. All right. Where are you headed to now? Stephen, did you get your phone under your name tag?